Hello and welcome to Made Mother Matriarch with me, Louise Perry. My guest today is Kathleen Stock, uh, infamous philosopher, author of Material Girls, which was published in 2021, and now the co-director of The Lesbian Project, including The Lesbian Project podcast, which Kathleen uh, co-presents with Judy Bindle. We spoke today about um, our disagreements over reactionary feminism. I tried very hard to persuade Kathleen of my position on reactionary feminism. I don't know if I succeeded. In the extended version uh, of the episode, we also spoke about whether or not uh, there ought to be sex own, sex specific roles in say the military and the police whether men should be nannies basically how far um, Kathleen is willing to accept the, uh, the, the the sex differences doctrine in terms of designing society um, that extended version of the episode can be found at louiseperry.substack.com where you can also find the whole back catalogue of extended episodes the MMM chat community and the bonus episodes that I do fortnightly with my husband enjoy Many of you will know that Christianity is a subject of fascination for me and the role of Christianity in shaping the modern world is a theme I return to again and again on the podcast. My view is that we really can't understand the world or ourselves without getting to grips with it, which is why I'm very glad to point you towards a new online course called 321. It's an introduction to Christianity that's imaginative, thoughtful, engaging. It assumes absolutely no prior knowledge. It's presented by the wonderful Glenn Scrivener, who has been a guest on the MMM podcast previously and I've also been a guest on his show. Glenn presents eight video-led sessions which are based around some beautiful animated stories that illustrate the Christian message. You can check it out for free at 321course.com forward slash MMM. Just enter your email, choose a password and you're in. There's no spam, there's no fees. Just visit 321course.com forward slash MMM. And now onto the show. Okay, Kathleen, uh, start at the deep end. Are you? Do you still consider yourself on the left, even though the left have been fairly horrible to you over the last several years? If I had to pick a descriptor, I think I'd definitely be more left than right. But if, obviously, there is a variety of lefts, and um, I've got nothing in common with um, the sort of pseudo progressive identitarian um, who would also say vociferously that they were on the left, and even the far left potentially. Um, so insofar as I'm, I still am, I still believe in, uh, you know, the welfare state and I think it should get bigger than it is. And I think it's the government's role to tackle austerity and, um, uh, you know, I believe in trade unions and backing the worker over the corporation so yeah, I mean, all of that sounds to me like I must be on the left. It does rather. Is it kind of old left? I guess, yeah. I mean, I'd, uh, I'm, I don't know exactly where I would fit. And obviously I'm going to disagree with everybody about something. Um, but yes, and I, uh, I think probably further left than Starmer, as far as I can tell. I mean, he doesn't seem very left to me at all. But we'll see. I guess at the moment it's very difficult to say what his policies will be because he's clearly trying to attract... Uh, as many voters as possible. I don't seem to be following the trajectory of other gender critical feminists <laughs> ideologically. <laughs> and I'm also a bit hor horrified by the the right. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting sort of bifurcation, isn't it? Um, that some gender critical feminists have gone the route that our critics always said mm. that we would. <laughs> and they've yeah. just, well, and they they just have. kind of become right wing. <laughs> But I think that's partly, I mean, I think it's a reaction to people rather than policies. Oh, it's not, that's not strictly true. It's clearly a reaction to some policies. But um, I think there's a real urge in some people to find a tribe that fits them. Whereas mm. I have no urge to be in a tribe at all. Um, mm. And I would be horrified by the average um, uh, PL. See, you know, I don't, I don't want to join the Labour Party. I have been in the Labour Party a couple of times, but I don't really want to join anymore. I would never go along to a meeting. I don't join in. I'm not a joiner inner. So I'm not bothered by the fact that there are lots of people that I wouldn't want to be associated, not I wouldn't want to hang around with um, or be associated with, actually. I mean, like Owen Jones, people like that, Billy Bragg, <laughs> they kind of disgust me in terms of ideas and sensibilities and an ideology I think I have to be 
there rather than elsewhere. It's funny, you know, I actually only resigned from the Labour Party last week. I've been a member of the Labour really? Party. Really? I can't really. believe they didn't yeah. kick you out. <laughs> I know. I guess I was just flying under the radar. I think, <laughs> I think I've only ever mentioned in writing maybe once that I'm a member of the Labour Party. And I, I joined um, back in the Corbyn days because I wanted to vote against, because I don't like Corbyn. So I, I oh, you want to vote against Corbyn, right. Yeah, so okay. I, I did it sort of strategically because I wanted a more, because I was more left-wing back in the day and I wanted more um, a more uh, electable leader of the Labour Party. And then I just sort of stayed in the Labour Party. And then I really only left because I don't really believe in flouncing out of political parties, like who cares, right? Um, but it's more that they sent me a reminder that my direct debit was due and I was like, I actually don't, <laughs> I actually don't want to give you money. <laughs> so, yeah, so I just sent a, a sort of private email saying, could you stop my direct debit, please? And that was that. Um, yeah, I think that your 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 desire not to be a joiner in a is um, uh, uh, rare and admirable. I think most people want to be joiner in and maybe that's... Oh, I don't think it's admirable. it's necessary. I think it comes from deep uh, misanthropy. Misanthropy. <laughs> like um, no, I just never have been. Yeah, yeah, I think there is a role for people like me, and and it's definitely the fact that I wasn't a joiner in her that allowed me to see some problems in um, trans activism very quickly and articulate them. I think quite a lot of people see them, but then th- to be able to articulate it um, without the sort of ties behind me that might have stopped me made it easier. Yeah, I mean, you suffered a serious social cost, uh, like a, a well-documented social cost that I'm not going to make you uh, repeat from having really been in the belly of the beast from being at Sussex. So that, I, I mean, I always, I, I, I often say to people when they say, oh my goodness, you must get so much flack, yada, yada. I say, I actually don't really because I think that I, I'm not in any kind of institution in which I might be expelled. So there's no yeah. vulnerability there. And That's also, the worst. I, right. And also I think I've kind of been pegged as she's a conservative who cares so there isn't that ambivalence which really drives rage. yeah that's that's 100 percent it i think the the more that you are clear and direct about what you think and show that you won't back down just because some people are going oh my god i can't believe you said that um and worse <laughs> uh then they just lose interest but the, the main driver is not having a boss to complain to anymore i mean i just don't have one that anyone can get to um, and I don't have colleagues in the same way. I'm totally freelance now. So obviously I've lost, you know, some kind of priority. Julie Bendel's but... not going to kick you yeah. off a lesbian project for <laughs> well, She might, time. she might, <laughs> for completely different set of reasons. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you have a different set of vulnerabilities now, maybe. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I'm happy with these. So, okay, so to, to, to go back to the left-right thing, here, here's my complaint against left-wing gender critical feminism. What are the chances that the left is right about everything except this one thing on which they're incredibly dramatically wrong? <laughs> That's basically my reasoning. That's not very good reasoning. I mean, <laughs> yes, of course you're right. They're, they're going to be wrong about lots of things. But that, I mean, first of all, we can't possibly make um, omniscience or <laughs> infallibility the standard by which we uh, choose our political side. And I'm sure you think that the right are wrong about some things maybe or don't you no 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 of course i do of course i do i guess or do you more... just think it's just such an egregious mistake yes because it's so particularly egregious because it's so reality denying because it's built on such shoddy um theoretical foundations as of course you know and because it's been and because any criticism of it has been shut down so aggressively to me that says something about the package of beliefs that I think it comes yes, from. Yes, it does. And I mean, I think the deeper, the better response I should have said is that I think that there is a sensibility in within the left, deep within the left, mainly within the kind of bourgeois left that is, um, is totally focused on hysterical victimisation, mainly on behalf of others. Like there's this kind of constant projection of, these imaginary suffering entities. Sometimes there are really suffering people, but it's not that, I mean, often they're very suffering people, but in this sensibility I'm talking about, there's not a real connection. It's more of a hysterical kind of fantasy of suffering on behalf of some group in the hierarchy in order to reflect back, basically. I'm talking about sort of unconscious processes, reflect back well on the 
the person who's emoting wildly. Um, and that seems to me very deep in the modern left, but it's not, it doesn't have to be there that, you know, I mean, there's plenty of left wing people who are tough as old boots, who are not sentimental um, about suffering and are not massive narcissists. <laughs> um, so I don't, I think we can conceptually separate those two things, but I do think that um, that's one of the deeply unattractive aspects of the left for me. And it's not, it's across the board as well. I mean, it really is to do with class, I think, more than to do with ideology, like from far left to center, that the people are just most susceptible to wild emoting are middle class, upper middle class, sort of quite well off and probably carrying quite a lot of guilt or something weird going on for them. This is a fast yeah, generalization. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's true. And I think, yes, okay, so I don't think that your sort of hard-bitten trade unionist old labour bloke is um is 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 gonna sign up to any of the trans stuff. That I think that that's definitely true. No, they think and it's I, nonsense. Yes, and I think I still have a lot of well, I don't know, I don't really have a very strong opinion on some of the economic left stuff because I am not an economist and I I I have no idea whether minimum wage laws are actually good for the poor or bad for the poor. It seems like a an empirical question to which I don't have the answer. Um I agree with you that there, there's a sort of, yes, there's a bourgeois left sensibility from which all the trans madness comes, which is, I guess, this kind of raging against human nature. Yes, I mean, that's that's a broad characterization. I don't think they're all necessarily, that's their immediate impulse. They end up raging at human nature, but partly because other people are raging at human nature and that's it benefits them to get on that bandwagon. But I'm thinking also of the sort of sensibility that kind of shuts down all play and jokes and fun and irreverence and everything has to become so serious and performative uh, and boring, <laughs> you know, and there's not there's not real anarchy um, in the sensibility I'm talking about at all. There's nothing like, I, again, I would think um, the left should be associated with coolness, genuine coolness and anarchy and <laughs> irreverence. And, and it's so weird that they all position themselves as rebels, but they're also conforming, um, the people I'm talking about in terms of their ideas. And they're also boring and, and allergic to dark humour or anything fun, <laughs> as far yeah. as I can see, drinking, smoking, etc. Yeah, the new, the, the new Puritans. Yeah, they really are. Yeah. 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 It's very interesting on. that the new Puritans have latched on to like kink as their well have they course. really i don't even know if they have you know they I say they they say that they do they say that they do I'm but yeah they do it very like some kind of religious ceremony with all the <laughs> <laughs> i think in the bureaucratic elements of kink of maybe yeah, exactly there'll be yeah. handbooks and you keep yes. looking on your phone to check if you're doing it right to say with polyamory know. polyamory lends itself to spreadsheets oh yes um, oh yeah i could see that yeah. one coming because there were these philosophers insufferable philosophers that when I was still in the profession who were all into polyamory and talking about polyamory and make it end up being seriously sententious and worthy about polyamory like it was some kind of ethical choice we should all be making but they used to say or one of them in particular who wrote a book about it called Carrie Jenkins used to say you know I think there's an interview with her in in the Inside Higher Ed or something where she starts by saying the problem with polyamory is the scheduling you know and, and it it just makes it immediately sound incredibly dull and stressful. And clearly it is, as it happens, because humans are humans. OK, so I think I, I, I'm, being, I'm being a bit provocative by saying that they're, they're opposed to human nature. I, I realise that, yes, that probably the driving force is more status signalling and conformism and all this kind of more, um, I suppose, day to day social factors. But I do think that there's something in there about this, like, in, this, this, it's not only a an opposition to hierarchy, which is characterizes the left in general. I think that would characterize the old left as well. It's also, I think, a, a real opposition to the idea of that of well, it's a it's a commitment to the blank slate, isn't it? Which comes with fear of any ever you know, as with polyamory, for instance, yeah. the idea that maybe jealousy can't be overridden. Maybe actually there are reasons yeah. why people feel sexual jealousy. That sort of, they really, really don't like that. And I think that's the unifying view that unites so many of the different, uh, otherwise disparate political beliefs. And trans is really the most extreme manifestation of that because that's the full on, like, you can, 
you can completely erase not just your psychological sexual characteristics but your physical ones as well and and sort of have absolute freedom to um, resist human nature. Yes, I mean, I think some of it's a byproduct of deeper commitments, like the stuff about um, just not even realising that some things are non-negotiable because you become so programmed to think that everything is up for self-improvement. It also goes along with the kind of seeing yourself as a project and constantly being on the lookout to self-improve yourself in various ways and everything's a choice so that it's not just about I mean I'm not it's a chicken and egg thing I don't know which com- which kind of myth comes first I do think that the motives for rejecting oh, well the motives for blank slateism no, this is me being a bit speculative but um a lot of them are well-intentioned or were well-intentioned you know I do think as multiculturalism got embedded in western life it, it is it was an attempt to like just not talk about things that were difficult that might cause division. So originally, um, kind of acting like uh, biology is absolutely negligible to family life because there is a family next door who's adopted their children, or there's a gay couple next door. That you know, it's an attempt to to for so, to produce social harmony, and that's mm. not a bad. Um, aspiration people became so uncritical about these kind of useful fictions that they um there were lots of knock-on effects elsewhere about what people just don't aren't willing to consider or think is absolutely false and and about our human our our animal selves and i do think we are animals i mean we clearly are thinking of feminism i i totally get that there are that, that that they're being immense differences between male and female natures can really easily be used against women and frequently has been used against women. Have you ever seen that clip of Jermaine Greer being told by some fogey that women can't possibly be pilots because their menstrual cycles would mess with them, you know, psychologically and they'd like crash the planes? And this is a great thing with Jermaine Greer because she's she's just so cool and so glamorous, just turns to him and said, am I menstruating now? The point being, of course, you can't tell, you right? Can't like tell, this yeah. is this is ridiculous, and I and I obviously think that it's ridiculous to sort of ban women from operating heavy machinery when they're menstruating, <laughs> right? Do, yeah, yeah. Good, I'm relieved to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> but I but I do see that that is one possible route that you can go down if you're really emphasising the, the differences between the sexes psychologically. It's a it's a massive risk, yeah. I don't think that the the sort of right that's in love with, slightly in love with um, trad. Uh, depictions of heteronorm- heterosexuality and family life and Christian family life are fully in touch with, or maybe the women amongst them are fully in touch with how shit uh, many women's lives were. And um, I mean, I was thinking about this today. I'm not saying my, so I was thinking about my grandmother and I'm not saying her life was shit because I actually think it was, she thought it was a good life, but it, it's, it's almost inconceivable to me now that, so for instance, she, she worked every day of her life and she died of stomach cancer very agonizingly and my dad had to take the washing down from the line the day she died <laughs> you know she'd that she'd put up in the morning um so and she was working for men the whole time she had a guest a little guest house and she had her men that she looked after she cooked for she cleaned for she did everything for them and her boys so um you know I, <laughs> there's there was a whole lot of other factors around then I'm not saying she had a terrible life, but these days I don't think with the modern mind that you can just plant that this kind of sensibility that's liberalised, that has um, access to the market and to the jobs, um, to the jobs market, and just transplant that back artificially. It's a bit like the National Trust, <laughs> you know, <laughs> doing up an old house and making you believe you're in 1950, but you know you're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it's larping basically. I think yeah. that is, yeah. I think that certainly is true for 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 a lot of the sort of trad content you see on the internet. Okay. Um, so, what's your vision of the the future? What would be a good um, situation for for women in fifty years' time? What I hope to do, what I think, I guess, is the reactionary feminist project, is to find a way of creating a more like sustainable i think that status quo is unsustainable not least because it causes crashing birth rates which means that the culture goes up in smoke eventually right 
So you need to have a culture which is sort of is pro maternity. Also, I would hope provide space for those people for whom motherhood and fatherhood are completely the wrong thing. There will always be those people. There always have been. That is, I mean, the the challenge. It really is a challenge. Is to have simultaneously a default culture, but also be tolerant of people who fall outside of the default. Yeah, like Whereas the non-normative, seems... like me, for instance. Right. Whereas it seems that at the moment we have having a default culture is is forbidden, at least within the sort of progressive worldview, which does mean that people, you know, for instance, that that motherhood is just seen as a kind of lifestyle to- choice, which shouldn't be valorized in any way. If anything, I mean, I, I would say progressive culture tends to denigrate motherhood because it's going right to the other end of the of the it's it's it's. it's 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 a reaction against traditionalism, um, but the challenge. I mean, you're right. Tr- traditional societies were from really horrible women and for men. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd say probably <laughs> more because of poverty, in general. I'd say that yes, poverty but is I probably. Think it's very yeah. hard to have any kind of. Um, I mean, I just have it. I uh, given it, that you're not, uh, you know, you're looking for a, this all to be happening in a relatively affluent society. Where okay, yeah. presumably there is l- very little coercion, so mm. you want to produce a culture, do you, that that sort of incentivizes women to get married, have children with men, stay married, um, and stay at home? Is that? A, but it can't be the old one, so it has to be new. It still has to be some kind of choice, even if it's or it has to feel like a choice from the inside, maybe. Yeah, I mean, stay at home during the young children years. And given that we have very long lifespans, that's not actually that high a proportion of your adult years. But yes, uh, I mean, I think there are certain things that aren't ever going back into the into the bottle, right? Like we have the internet, we have all of this stuff now. So we have, we have the pill. So whatever comes, whatever culture came out, it isn't going to look exactly like the 1950s or the 1450s is going to, it is going to be different. I think though that my assumption is that there are lots of ways in which our current culture is very unusual and is very, very different from, which is to say is very, very different from all the cultures that have come before and in, in other parts of the world. And that seems to me to almost certainly be indicative of us being it not being self-sustaining. We need to find some way, you know, like for instance, every culture has some kind of conception of marriage. And that suggests to me that there's something about marriage which serves an important function. And that if you try and get rid of it, you're either going to have to recreate it in some new way or you're going to have social problems because whatever function it's performing isn't being performed. So, you know, Mary has this line about the reactionary is like chasing shades on sacred hills. I can't remember exactly what it is, but the, the, the reason that she alighted on the word reactionary rather than conservative is because conservative suggests a different relationship to the recent past. Conservative suggests that you want to retain the status quo or whatever recent setup like the 1950s say. Whereas in Mary's mind, reactionary is more about finding deeper commonalities across mm. time and place and trying to successfully recreate them in your own culture. Mm. Is that persuasive? <laughs> I've got a wave a magic wand and or maybe model it up 4D so I can see this properly. I, mean, I think in terms of just in terms of the semantics, I think reactionary I think we're all reactionary these days that everybody's reacting to everybody else. That's part That's of the true. problem in politics. <laughs> Nobody can find a sort of still centre or not even, I don't mean centre ground, I just mean some place that isn't just a um Oh, I'm not with them. <laughs> I don't think that I'm with them. But um, but it's true that um, you're really revolu- you're proposing a revolution. There's nothing conservative about what you're proposing, and in fact, liberals would be the most conservative because we are in a thoroughly liberalised society, like you say. And I, I don't think I personally think um, there'd have to be massive economic changes and. Um, God knows what else, some kind of apocalypse <laughs> to get uh, to get to the kind of stage you might think was good. And I'm obviously, you wouldn't think it was good if there was an apocalypse involved. 
So, no, or, or indeed a violent, violent revolution. Um, no, no. I mean, I don't disagree that it's a really tough project and I'm not really expecting to win. And I also don't have any power whatsoever, so, so it's all completely academic. But I actually think that most people, though, most people are instinctively quite conservative. And, by which you mean by, by in, in In terms of safe family stuff, like would like to have children, would like to get married, all of that kind of normie stuff has never really been erased in terms of people's aspirations. I definitely think they want to have children. But I mean, as we can see, gay men want to have children. Um, lots, of, lots of people want to have children. And that's to do with, that could, well, it could be a range of things, but obviously in some cases it's to do with just not being willing to accept your own mortality <laughs> I don't know feeling like you want to leave someone behind it might not be as Freudian you. as that it might, be, it might just be the babies are cute or whatever it's a biological drive yeah yeah well that um, too but I think lots of people want yeah. children but I don't know that I think they want to get married you know as part of that deal they maybe want to be with someone and, and obviously there's a cultural or an actual reason why doing it with somebody else is better than doing on your own um in terms of resources shed labor and so on but um i'm not sure i understand why marriage has to be in that story you think that mo okay two questions do you think that most people <laughs> are, are don't aspire to marriage as much as i'm assuming or well you've probably you think... got some stats that you've fingertips to tell me that I'm wrong, I don't I don't my... I don't really <laughs> I'm, I'm okay, good. Just going off my like my like Instagram feed where women are oh, well, well I, I think you might find that that's, rings, that's a bit of a bubble you know you've heard of tailored to me rings. yes <laughs> um but second question do you do you think that marriage regardless of what polling might say do you think that ha having an institution like marriage say returning to a, a stronger institution of marriage than we have now might have net social benefits that would be good in general i think or... it would be good to incentivize couples to stay together for the sake of the children mm -hmm. and i speak as a divorcee <laughs> um but i can see i can see that uh everyone could see that i think if they were being honest um with obviously some exceptions uh when the when the um, environment is unsafe or extremely toxic but um but i don't know about this you know making it much harder to divorce, um, perhaps I'm not keeping up with the latest thinking on this and how it might be compatible with allowing women to get out of abusive relationships. What I do, I've always thought, I'm sure you agree with me, is if we're going to start strengthening marriage as an institution, we're going to have to do a lot more beforehand with um, people to, um, to tool them up to choose uh, partners and, and I'm talking mainly about men who won't try to kill them <laughs> or won't drink themselves to death in front of them or um you know there's there's obviously I think we're not very good at having difficult conversations about what a appropriate partner looks like if the proposal is that you can't immediately leave as soon as things go wrong yeah that's true I mean I th the once one stat on my side in this case is that women in who are not married to their partners are actually more likely to be victims of domestic violence than women who are married to their partners i don't think that's because marriage has a magical no it's ability not. to reduce domestic violence it's because of who's it's, it's basically i think a class marker probably that's yes stat. i think that's um, true yeah um but it does at least suggest that it's not as if marriage, well, marriage is it worse yeah no probably not not being able to get out of i mean I'd also say that normally the thing that stops a woman, at least nowadays, the thing that stops women leaving abusive relationships isn't anything legal or even even really practical things. It's, it's, it's almost always the psychological impediments to leaving. And I, and I mean, I do think that it should be easier to... Look, no, I, I, I completely agree with you. I, I do obviously not... I really don't want women who are being abused to be stuck in marriages and I don't no, I know no you don't because you, and I'm your, not quite sure it's behind that <laughs> I I'm not quite sure what the like how you perfectly design any kind of institution policy whatever so that you what we basically want is we should say you really should stay in your marriage unless you have a great reason not to the problem is that it's left to people to subjective <laughs> decision making as to whether or not they have a great reason it's still left and I assume it would 
this in this respect would only get worse rather than better under the new sort of regime. It's left to women to do mind-bogglingly um, dull, repetitive, knackering, sleepless um, work, you know, and, and, and then be still be surrounded by a kind of world that invites them outside or tells them that there's all these exciting things happening everywhere they're just not part of. Now, it, obviously, for some people, you know, they hear my words and they think, how can you think that's dull? It's the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. It's wonderful. It's amazing. But lots and lots of women don't feel like that because there is a, quite a lot that's extremely boring about it or tiring about it, exhausting about it, thankless about it, especially if your children are difficult or, you know. So there's just a lot of stuff that the feminists were right to draw attention to. It, or anyone's right. It doesn't have to be feminist. It's just a fact that we should recognise that a lot of it is... is um is not its own reward and and at the same time we've now got a world which says there's all these other routes available to you and we're not proposing i've assumed to cut them all off <laughs> too so it's always going to be a challenge i think in a modern world to make it look attractive without becoming somewhat coercive and i just don't think that would be the right route so I, I don't know what the solution is exactly, but I just feel like these problems need to be. Yeah. So I, I, I partially agree. I would, I'd, I'd, it is clearly really hard work having little children in particular. Um, I would say that I, I'm not sure that most masculine work, it, it would typically have shorter hours. I'm not sure that it's preferable. If the, if the choice that I'm offered is whether or not I be a stay at home mum or I work, uh, I don't know, Maybe I'm a, a coal miner, like sprung to mind. That's not very fair because that's particularly dangerous. There's hardly any coal work. mines anymore. Yeah, but like working in an Amazon warehouse, say. Oh yeah, there's some shit jobs around. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's well, the like, worst. You've chosen but, the worst. Though. But it's not the worst though. I'd say that that's actually like most jobs are pretty boring and repetitive. There are, yeah, there are upsides, are. like social upsides, for instance. And there's and I think that's one of There's a kind yes. of um, sense of progress in many workplaces yes, and, and renew remuneration and recognition to some degree and yes. not being isolated so yeah it's not perfect and uh, status this is what I was going to say I so I'm mm. not sure I'm not sure that say I, I think that motherhood is probably preferable to like 90% of jobs actually all the same as like 90% of jobs the problem is that it isn't considered certainly isn't considered as high status as the top 10% of jobs and also isn't really considered to be as high status as m most masculine jobs, with some exceptions. I think that I think so often what we end up talking about when we're talking about sort of the, the shittiness of women's work is not so much the work itself, it's actually the status attached to it. And feminists are completely right to have observed that early on, you know, that all the, the women are basically at the bottom of the heap status-wise. We've just never quite worked out what to do about that how yeah because you don't want the i mean the it. thing the problem is the, the obsession with status i think and that again is a non non-negotiable feature of the modern world particularly with the internet and i don't want a world in which um you know sachi and sachi managed to persuade the female population that um it's it's really cool to be a mum and they're you know even work you know everyone's <laughs> more even more on instagram showing off their children and because that's not really the right motivation either I think you, the ideal situation is just sort of baked into your um, your mind that you'll have kids <laughs> and you don't ag agonise too much about it. You just do it and then worry about it afterwards. Because that's certainly how I did it. I mean, in retrospect, if I thought about it and chosen it really very consciously, I don't think I'd have done it. I just did it. Um, and I think if everyone um, used to be like that, they'd just be like, yeah, of course I'm going to have kids. What do you mean? Do I want them? That's not what I'm, you know, do I want them, want them? <laughs> no, but I'm going to have them. And and I don't know how to get back to that. I think what often gets set up as the sort of the feminist choice is, is, is do you choose to have children with all of the onerous aspects of that? Or do you choose to aspire to the top 10% of jobs or even the top 1% of jobs? And as, as if that's the choice. That is the choice for some people, um, including me, to be honest. But I don't think it is the choice for most people, so it seems like it's a false binary and that we're therefore being harder on motherhood than we ought to be. 
Yeah, that's true. I mean, and this is a discussion that's going on amongst people who've, who've usually come out of very good universities and got good degrees. And, um, you know, and I, I come from a, I was born and raised in a small Scottish uh, fishing town and most of my friends are, are there or in the area and they've all married and had kids and none of them split up as far as I'm, I'm doing quick, but as far as I can remember, none of them split up out of my immediate friend circle. Um, and they didn't, you know, they didn't want to go and get a job at the Guardian or whatever, you know, if that wasn't there, that wasn't even a thought again, like <laughs> talking about like your field of, um, ambitions is obviously constrained partly by culture and um what's around you and that just living in England wasn't even there for most of them and not and neither living in Edinburgh or Glasgow so I have another friend from rural Scotland who um who described the same I find it completely mind-boggling she's like she's a sort of envoy from the 1950s like, <laughs> like she, she said for instance there were no there were no nurseries like anywhere within easy oh, radius wow. of where she grew up because it was in the highlands because like you, you didn't send your child to nursery yeah that's probably right so, in my generation but then i'm older than my yeah. children now i'm sure but yeah there was a play group um, right yeah but the, yeah but but the mums used to volunteer at it yes I think, in my school yeah. yeah and then if a mum did work she says it would be part-time and then the granny would step in and that was how it was yes and that is exactly yeah. how it is grannies yeah. are still doing um large amounts of looking after I mean across the board in my family wide well, extended family in England as well the grannies are doing large amounts of things mm -mm. I think it's very whereas even I think when I was growing up in the 90s in London this was absolutely not the case so I think there's a lot of regional variation and there's still what's that line about the future's already here it just isn't evenly distributed I think that yes <laughs> rural Scotland is just slightly um <laughs> yeah behind the times on this I'm sure I'm sure they but then uh, they, also <laughs> that's a reason for you not to be so doom laden you should just like get out of London and things yeah. aren't as bad as you think they are oh I'm sure that's true I, I do actually because we are actually moving out of London soon and I do actually think that probably like 90% of my sort of doom laden politics yeah, sure. would disappear. I'll see the optimistic <laughs> Perry. <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. I was only very pro modernity. Yeah. I take this, this I, I'm, I'm enjoying reactionary feminism being needled. I think we should, I think it's worth needling. I mean, it's also difficult, right? Because one of the, I have said this before, one of the problems with being any kind of conservative is that you, you not being a utopian, and also being sort of orientated towards the past means you get stuck in this position of having to defend the whole sort of sweep of history. So you say, you know, things were things were better in some regards, there were some institutions we shouldn't throw away. And then you end up being put in the position of having to defend every downside of that of that institution, of that of, of that cultural practice, whatever. Whereas if you're a utopian, you get to say, I've got this bright idea, it's going to be amazing. And there's no downside. To defend oh, because it's well <laughs> except when people ask a few probing questions about I it. suppose I mean. so but there's nothing concrete because it's because it's all hypothetical yeah but do you have to do either I mean I think like I say as I think probably you can tell there's not it's it's not that I don't think the past might have been better in some respects it's just that I think it's the past and um liberalization globalization um has broken the bonds with the past and made it like impossible to build a bridge back to it so we are where we are and at that point I become conservative in the sense of like nobody move <laughs> let's think very hard about what we do now because I'm very aware I think this is a do share with conservatives that like revolution can bring unintended effects that are devastating I've now seen the um the terrible impacts of utopian thinking on the bodies of children um, women in prison forced to shower with rapists, you know, and I can see how um, some kind of massive deliberate reordering of society, given the talent on <laughs> display in the political world or anywhere else is, you know, does not strike me as a, as a good thing. So I, I think things can always get worse, is what I'm saying. Things can always get worse. And I think people are not enough tuned into things can always get worse. But but that doesn't, so I, I'm not a utopian in that sense. But I don't see why um, you have to def defend 
every aspect of the past like why does that follow or sorry of the institutions that you that you prefer why do you so have to marriage is aspect? marriage is one example right so you might say if you're if you're a critic of marriage and i'm not i'm not saying that you say this but someone might say um you know here's my new model there's absolutely no religious state involvement in relationships people just kind of choose whatever it will kind of cook up some image of what you could have i see so because we've actually run it in real time we've seen how it worked so there are lots of exactly like now exactly. you need to to be say well what about this and what about this and what about that exactly um, which yeah. puts you puts you mm. immediately on the back foot i'm just whinging really <laughs> Yeah, but it also makes you at least a more serious-minded person and it makes the project somehow more doable, although less attractive in the, in, to, to, to people who are um, not very thoughtful. But I think actually it's, it's, you have to do this. And you might also, you've also got to just keep saying, unfortunately, that nothing's perfect and that eventually you're going to have to make decisions about costs versus benefits. And you might decide. The trou- I think the trouble is women keep getting... Uh, in every modelling that I can think of, women are um, bear the costs. Why do you think that is? Because of because of us being physically more vulnerable. Um, is that the key thing? Yes, that I really think move? that is really. I think the natural facts about men and women give men an advantage um, in power relationships, especially in the home, in intimate relationships. Of course, they may choose not to um, use that advantage, but many will and the more the culture is kind of permissive towards oh god i'm starting to say things that i've heard other people say and i've really disagreed with <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna turn into a bloody liberal feminist <laughs> but i mean i was seeing some images i saw some images on the internet today of, of um a poor woman being killed in afghanistan i didn't want to see them but they just turned up on my timeline you know, uh, through a number of stages, <laughs> being run over with a car, being set on fire, <laughs> and the, all these men around her because she'd, you know, she's been accused of burning a Quran or something. Um, and it's not like I think in within every man there is the capacity to do that, but I think um, I think the vast majority of men would carry on tr- looking for respectful relationships with women, but. There is, there are outliers already, and there would be more of them in a in a society which didn't pay much attention to um, the possibilities of women um, being violently aggressed within the home, for instance. No, okay. So here we are, completely in agreement, and it's a very interesting and important question. How do you, if if we accept, and I and I get accused of being anti male for saying this, but I think it's just obviously true. If we accept that there's some unknown proportion of men who are sexually violent and and just generally very high in sort of reactive aggression it's it's obviously on a spectrum there's some small minority who are always like this and then there's some space in the middle where it depends on context so i think that the, the 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 key task of society is how to contain and potentially channel that instinct and that doing and that, that is the priority for any sort of society that wants to describe itself as feminist because yes women are women are so vulnerable to that to those kind of men and i you know and by the way i don't think that those kind of men should be getting married to anyone <laughs> no <laughs> right and how to identify them is a very important yeah, and challenging task so i agree task. with all of this yes but i guess the I question mean, I think is this... what kind of society does that best i think ours doesn't do it badly compared to other societies um that you might think of i mean no no i think that's true i think that's true i think why we do it better i'm not so i don't know i don't really know i mean i i get very frustrated with superficial um sort of uh, kind of whiny whining about men i get i get annoyed about it um and i get i get annoyed with the sort of the the blunt tool that some feminists will wield in this area where they're just fetching about men generally <laughs> as if any man is just like at any point could go off or they just all have it in them to turn at any point and a lot of that seems to me to be based in kind of um personal historical animus i don't know what it is it's psychological you know i don't have any of that 
I really don't have any of that. I'm like male identified pretty much. Um, I have two sons. Uh, I'm furious if anyone suggested that they were like, you know, a problem in any way because they were men. And, you know, Sadiq Khan's kind of um, campaign on the tube to stop men staring at women and stuff like that. Or... The mate, 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 mate campaign. Yeah, yes. sexual banter. The idea that sexual banter leads to violence. I, I'm completely contemptuous of all of that. Um, I think what leads to violence is like um, growing up in a violent home, being poor often um, and... I swear you're, sound, you're saying, sounding like a the... soft lefty, Kathleen. It also does come from... Well, I am a like, soft lefty. <laughs> from testosterone. Yeah, and, and, you know, and testosterone. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Because these things are multifactorial. Yes. Of course, it comes from testosterone. <laughs> but you, it doesn't just come from testosterone. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe in sort of moments of red mist descending for some middle-class boy occasionally, it's just testosterone. It's also the, the vicissitudes of personality and... Um, temperament and stuff which is partly inherited and partly environmental everything's partly inherited and partly environmental so um, yeah it's complicated to solve definitely uh, conviction rates you know taking it seriously in the courts I think I'm kind of on the side of Julie Bindle and people like that on, on just locking them locking the rapists up oh yeah I mean that's a point that Julie and I will never ever diverge on <laughs> yes i'm very um very proud cast carceral feminist yeah i'm a carceral feminist for men not yeah. for women yes um but the idea that like stopping people flirting is somehow a meaningful response to um domestic violence or rape is just ridiculous yeah and and actually the kind of the elision of all of these different things under the banner of feminism is 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 probably worth i mean but I I think that rape crisis and domestic violence shelters are a wonderful thing and they didn't used to exist and they do now exist thanks to feminists. And I think that paying, you know, one of the things that I think feminism feminism does, which is sort of historically novel, is it, is it, it provides a political force to represent the interests of women who, who, who don't basically have male kin to advocate for their interests. You know, all cultures do have some kind of prohibition on rape. But it's generally rape committed against some women. And then there are other women who are considered completely rapeable and no one cares. And what feminism does is it says, no, we care. This this does actually matter. You know, so all of that, you know, I'm completely full I, I, I'm of. with you. Um, I, I mean, the point, perhaps you're being provocative, but, you know, feminism advocates for the people, for the women that don't have men to advocate for them. Does... I, I'm saying in practice, <laughs> that is basically funny. what it means. It's, I think that's true, though. Like in most cult, in most traditional cultures, right, if you have... Well, that's all st- of us then, right? That's all of us in this culture, because I don't see men advocating advocating for me that often, to be honest. I'm, I mean things like we have a police force. I mean that in a traditional society, if you don't have sturdy brothers and fathers and, and some kind of social status, if you get raped, nothing's going to happen to your rapist. Whereas we do, at least in theory, have the institutions established. And, you know, partly because feminists have been pushing so hard to get police and courts to care about rape. Yeah. Well, with, okay, you know, so... With kind of patchy success, but with some success. We definitely need it. We agree on the fact that we need these institutions. Um, yes. We can't yes. do it on our own. Yes. We I need don't a strong think... state, basically. Fem- it... Women need a strong state. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I completely agree. And I don't know if we should be grouping all of those that those political projects up under the same banner as the kind of the whiny stuff, <laughs> the more trivial no, stuff. No, the whiny stuff needs to be ditched. Yeah. Um, I mean, I wrote a piece a couple of weeks ago about um, James Cleverley's joke, that he made a joke about date rape. He was it was supposed to be off the record, but obviously someone leaked it. He said he um slipped for him not to his wife to stop her going off with other men. <laughs> I mean, it's the sort of thing that as I said in my article that kind of like it's just so inappropriate that it makes me laugh. But the way that um, you know, the Fawcett Society called for his resignation and it just that sort of thing is so disproportionately focused upon um in the fem in the in the professional feminist um world um because they don't want to talk about the really difficult things that you're talking about for instance whether or not people agree with you you're talking about them and um 
I and so I wrote this article and then immediately I saw yesterday Billy Bragg <laughs> tweeting about how anti-feminist Kathleen Stock defending disgusting date rape joke. Mm. <laughs> oh yeah, you're just proving my point, you wanker. <laughs> um, this, it's just, they're not, it's just too easy to police speech, as we know, mm. and rather than talk about these really difficult issues that do involve, like, saying what are we going to do about the inevitability of rapists in the world, that you're not going to be able to condition all of them out of it by any means. Yeah, and also produce some really sort of painful trade-offs. Um, like, you know, like, for instance, the, 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 if you have, if we were to expand the prison population, there probably would be disproportionality in terms of things like race and class. You probably wouldn't, you know, uh, given that that already exists in terms of the criminal well, justice Well, I do statistics. think I'm enough of a soft lefty to think that you need to do these things in tandem with um, socioeconomic remedies. Um, I don't believe in a just Wild West state where... Um, we shrink the state in other ways, but but um, invest more in policing. <laughs> um, I think I think we need to do a lot more all over the place. Sure, I, I'm 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 fine with that. But what we might end up with, certainly in the short term, and this is why the anti-castral feminists get so cross, is that you know if it is a choice between having restorative justice for rape victims and just locking up rapists, I'm, I, I want to lock up the rapists, but that probably will sort of that might not align with all of the other, like, lefty goals. Yeah, I, I accept the point. And, I mean, it's already... It would be ridiculous to suggest that the prison um, system wasn't chock full of working-class people anyway. I mean, it already is. Uh, and But I don't think that... You have to, you know, you have to complete the thought. It's not because working-class people are um, intrinsically more... born more criminal. <laughs> it's to do with circumstance. Um I think it's also what we've got though right so you sort of do you... yeah, yeah and then you yeah. so you do, you make a decision on behalf yes. of a vulnerable group and I mean this is I'm talking about rape and domestic violence so are you there's a, a whole other conversation to be had about other crimes and what you do there the episode is not over there is another maybe 30 minutes of content but it is behind a paywall if you would like access to that content if you would like to show support for the show pay subscriptions are what keep it on the road allow me to pay my producers put food on the table all that important stuff the extended version of the podcast is available at my substack louiseperry.substack.com that's where you can also find as i say every week bonus episodes extended episodes uh the mmm chat community all of this um please sign up for a pay subscription it makes such an enormous difference to my ability to keep producing the podcast and grow it even bigger produce more episodes all that good stuff there are other ways that you can show your support for the show as well. You can rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. You can like us on YouTube. You can tell your friends and family uh, how much you like the show. If you find it valuable, all of these things make an enormous difference to our ability to keep making it. Thank you so much. <laughs>